so glad that you came to be a part of our family this morning, right here in person, braving the elements that are outside, the, the little bit of snow we got, the little bit of ice, and you know the, the really, really cold weather. And then those who are online, we welcome you and thank you for tuning in uh, this morning and making this a part of the jump start to your week this morning. And if you're a guest of ours, we hope that when you came in, you felt like family. You got a card. Fill that card out, hang on to it, and then at the end of the service, go out those double doors and exchange it. There's a brown bag, and you can exchange it for that, and that's to say, hey, thanks for being a part of our family this morning. If you're a guest of ours online, there will be a link for you to click. Click that link, fill that out, and we would love to get something out to you as well. And then I just want to share with you just a little bit of what's on my heart this morning, and it's this whole idea of, of stirring. Uh, maybe like stirring to action. And it goes really along with the, the message this morning that God's uh, worked through me this week and this whole concept of, man, we get excited about a lot of things. And there are things that seem to drive our passion. Uh, you could name those things right now, you know, whether it's sports or whether it's a kids and, and your family, whether it's your job that excites you. I, we could just go through the list of, of all sorts of things that say, man, this is what I love to do and this is what I'm passionate about. And when you start to converse with that, it's like you get excited. You see your demeanor start to change and you start to kind of bubble up on the inside. And then it's like when we come to church, all of that shuts down. And we give God barely even like a little golf clap. And I think God wants us to be excited. I think God wants us to have a passion for who he is. And uh, that we sing loud and, and we're not afraid to worship him. And, and not that we come in a, a, a disrespectful way. But we come ready and excited, wanting to worship God, wanting to be excited and let Him just instill in us this passion of who He is and just this, this zeal for His presence and, and want to experience that. Not hold back singing, just, hey, let's sing it out. And it doesn't matter if you can't sing, I can't sing. But you know what? It's about praising God from the heart and what He wants to do in our lives this morning. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray us into the service this morning. And I just feel like that's where God wants us to be. And what my prayer is, is for you is that you're going to be able to posture yourself, this, posture yourself this morning to experience Him in a way you've never experienced Him before. To be able just to sense His presence and to put yourself in a place of obedience to be able to move toward His presence. As he's drawing you to him, and as you're abiding in him, and he abiding in you. So let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I am thankful that we get to come to a place like this every first day of the week. God, to lift your name, to praise your name, to speak your name, to pray to your name. God, to glorify your name. And God, I pray that we would get excited this morning. That, God, you would well in a, uh, up inside of us a passion, a fire, a hunger, a thirst for you and your righteousness. And that, God, this morning in our worship through song, through giving, through the message, through prayer, that, God, we would just start to overflow and that fire would start to come out of our lives. And God, it's a fire for you that you put inside of our hearts and that, God, we would pursue you this morning and want to be with you and want to engage in your presence. That, God, we would let you and allow you to have your way in our lives today. And that, God, transformation would take place. In Christ, I pray. Amen. Sing it from the trenches 
see you through the pain There's a song rising up Can you hear that freedom sound? Sing it from the shadow We're gonna sing it loud, loud, loud Son and 
of what Bye. 
can hardly speak a peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think as you call deeper still as you call deeper still as you call deeper still into love in peace my champion in all that I need I will wait for you I will wait for you Holy Spirit come renew
will choose light even in darkness your truth lights a beautiful spark in this heart and soul be still and know then my fear's gone even your presence a new song rises to heaven this heart the opportunity to come here and just be in your presence now. Lord, I pray that you would just speak through this message. I pray that you would change lives of the people in this room. I pray this in your wonderful and beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. So for these next two weeks, and this week and next week, we're, we're winding down this series, Made for More. 
And what my prayer is, is that in this series, you have found something that God has been doing in your life to show you that um, not to settle for just whatever, not to settle down for mediocrity, but to pursue God's version of more, because that's what we've talked about throughout this whole series. And where we started this series is where we have to continue this series today, and it comes out of John 10, 10, and it says this right here. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And if you were to break that down, it gives you two scenarios. And it's the two scenarios that we get the choice of living in every single day. It's to live with our eyes toward that which the thief wants to steal, kill, and destroy, or to live our life in abundance. And that's where we find ourselves oftentimes wrestling with the tension because if we were to look at the world, the world looks appealing. There's a lot of the things in the world that look good. They look satisfying and what they do is they promise satisfaction right then in the moment. But what the world doesn't tell you is what comes after that. That you need more of whatever that was. That you need to find yourself ingrained in more of this stuff. And that what the thief really wants to do is he wants to take you to a place where you feel satisfied, but ultimately killing, stealing, and destroying everything about you. And yet Jesus is the opposite. Jesus says, I came that you may not just have life, but have life abundantly. And yet what we find a lot of times is this word right here. And it's the word, eh. That's how it goes. It's just, this is a classic teenage word today. How was your day at school? Eh. Is I. Did you learn anything? Eh. Eh. No. Anything else you want to tell me? No? No? Not at all? Okay, good talk. Hopefully we can pick this back up at dinner. And yet what's funny is, is this teenage talk seems to spur itself and find itself in adult conversation. You know how this word comes about in adult conversation? How are you doing? Okay. You know what okay really means? Eh. What's fascinating about this word is this is not, it is a word, but it's not a word. It, it really means an expression. If you wanted to give it a definition, what is tied to this word is cold, indifference, bored, and apathetic. So how was your day? Just look at him and just say, it's cold, I'm indifferent, I'm bored, and to be honest with you, I'm kind of apathetic about my life right now. To be honest with you, I'd rather you not be asking me any of these questions. Okay. Well, listen, I promise you this, they'll never ask you again how your day is going. Unless they're really gung-ho. And they're like, I'm going to break this wall down. We are going to break through in. Eh. And yet, here's the reality, and it's funny to, to just kind of laugh and joke about this word, but the reality is, is that this has crept into the church. Christians today, I would, I would just argue really more so along the lines of American Christianity, um, it could really flow into probably Western Christianity, if you want to include Europe into this, is if the average churchgoer in their walk with the Lord is just... Eh, like, I'm not really here, I'm not really here, I'm just kind of here. And the Bible talks a lot about this. The Bible really speaks to us through this. And so we're going to be in two different places. We're going to be in Revelation 3 and we're going to be in Romans 12. 
okay? Two different places, tying the same kind of concept, pulling those two together. So if you want to follow along in the Word, just go ahead and jump to, to Revelation 3, because that's where we start. We start right here in 314a, and the angel of the church, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea right. Now, what I have to do is I have to give you a, 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 a geographical visual of what's going on in Laodicea. Laodicea is an extremely wealthy city. Laodicea has everything that you would want in a major city. They had university, they had medical, um, they were really known for their eye ointment that they had created on their own. Um, they were known for their black dyed wool, which they would weave into clothing and carpet and was very, very, very expensive at that time. Needless to say, this, this town had it. This town was extremely well to do. And, and had a lot going for it. People wanted to move to Laodicea. This is how wealthy Laodicea was. In AD 60 or around that time, that city was destroyed by an earthquake. And they rebuilt the city without the help of Rome, who was the world power at that time. That's how well to do they were. That's how things were going in this particular metropolitan area. It was good. Now, churches were planted in Laodicea. There's all kinds of areas over there, and you can, you can map all the way through this. And where you would find Laodicea today is modern-day Turkey. Now, what was just north, I think it was six miles north, roughly, was a town called Hierapolis. Hierapolis was also a well-to-do town, had a lot of things going for them. And in Hierapolis, they had these things that were called hot springs. It's these springs that people would show up to and um, they would use them for medicinal purposes, for medicine. They would go and they would sit in these hot springs for various ailments or whatever was going on in the body. Put it this way, it's like a natural hot tub there for you. Now, if you were to just go south of Laodicea, there's a town called Colossae. It's where the book of Colossians comes from. Just so you can reference two things. Colossae is quite fascinating too. It was known for its cold springs. So you had hot springs in the north, cold springs in the south, and dead in the center was Laodicea. These cold springs were invigorating and refreshing. People would come to, to gather this water up because it was cool, it was nice and refreshing. The way I imagine, and I've not been to Colossae today in the, in the modern day, but I have in Israel went to a, a place called Herod's Springs. And we were there in the middle of the summer. And there's this natural spring that bubbles up and it flows through all these little like, looks like creek almost style ravine things that are going through here all over the place. And people would flock to this state park where Herod Springs are and they'd sit in it. And they would just cool off and refresh. And let me tell you something, it's freezing, all right? In the middle of the summer at like, I don't know, it's probably 95 degrees these things are a nice, brisk, like 63. And the water is delicious. Now listen, I'm not drinking on the other end where the people are sitting. I'm drinking on the front end, okay? Let's clear that up, all right? I don't want to come on this end. You don't know what's coming through that, all right? It's like a kiddie pool, all right? I'm on the front end where the spring is bubbling up and you catch it right as it's coming out of the spring and flowing over a rock and you can reach down and you can drink it. It's probably some of the most refreshing water you've ever had in your life. I mean, it was just cool, crisp, and had zero taste to it. But it, there was something invigorating about it. And that's what's going on in Colossae. So you have Hierapolis, hot, Colossae, cold. The one thing Laodicea did not have is it did not have a good water source. If you don't have a good water source... In that area, you would build something in order to get water because water is critical. Water is important to a town and to a city to maintain and keep functioning. So what they would do is they would build these aqueducts from this area. Well, Colossae and Hierapolis were so distant away, even though maybe six miles doesn't seem like a lot, it is for water to travel. And so they built this aqueduct down 
And as the water would come into the city, here's the problem. It wouldn't be hot nor cold. It really wasn't that fantastic. It was just kind of that whole thing we just talked about. Eh, like, it, it was just okay. It was lukewarm. It wasn't tasty. You didn't want it. People would rather not have that particular water. They would rather have what's hot or what's cold at the bottom. And that's where Laodicea finds himself, which is why Jesus speaks this to the church. And he says to the angel of the church in Laodicea, he says, write this, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. He tells Laodicea, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. You're neither Hierapolis or Colossae. You're neither one of those two things. Would that you were either, either cold or hot, I would prefer you to be one of these two things. But the fact of the matter is, is you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. I will spit you out of my mouth. It's not that cold is being indifferent to Christ, and it's not that hot is being on fire to Christ. It's that these two things offered something and was evidence of something greater. And yet what Laodicea found themselves is, is just yeah, lukewarm, not good. What does lukewarm actually mean? Well, here's what lukewarm means. Think about this in the term meh, like just whatever. It's tepid, it's apathetic, half-hearted, indifferent, spiritless, and lifeless. Like, let that soak over you for a minute. Jesus was saying, you are lukewarm. He's telling Laodicea, you're tepid, you're apathetic, you're half-hearted, you're indifferent, you're spiritless, you're lifeless. That, that's not like a good letter. That's not what you want to receive as a church. And yet I would venture to say that if Jesus were to write letters to churches in America today, I would fear that more would fall in this category than the hot or cold category. And what I would ever, never, ever, ever, ever want to see an encounter, especially in my own life, is that I would be found in the sight of Jesus to be just lukewarm. That I'm tepid, I'm apathetic, I'm half-hearted, I'm spiritless, I'm lifeless, I'm bored, I'm cold, I'm indifferent. And to be honest with you, I kind of do the church thing just because it's just what you do. It's an easy thing to do. I can walk in, I can walk out, and I can walk in, eh, and I can walk out, eh, and my life is going to be, eh, the rest of the time. And I want you to really process John 10, 10 with me for a second. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy and what I would say this morning is that the enemy wants to see nothing more than a eh, Christian. If he can get people who proclaim to follow God to just be lifeless, spiritless, indifferent, and apathetic toward the world and toward the things of God, then the enemy is on his way to stealing, killing, and destroying that of the Christian. And that's Laodicea. He says, listen, I just wish you were hot or I wish you were cold, but you're neither. You're lukewarm. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. And Laodicea, what they were doing is they were just piggy or, or, or piggybacking on the back of what was going on in the city. And the church bought into it. The church in Laodicea bought what into what was going on in the city. How do we know this? Well, just look at Revelation 3, 17 and 18. And look at what he says. For you say, this is what you say, Laodicea in church, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiable, or pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. That's where Laodicea found themselves as a church. It's almost like, man, they found themselves among the American dream. A little scary how much this kind of really relates to 
what's going on today. You say, I'm rich, I've prospered, and I need nothing. We just do the church thing to do the church thing. We just come and we get this done and we knock it out and it's over. It doesn't do anything in my life the rest of the days of the week. And, and Jesus is saying, you don't realize something. You don't realize how wretched you are, how sinful you are, how poor you are, even though they were a wealthy people. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness and salve. That's the ointment that they had there for their eyes and salve to anoint your eyes so that you will see. He's basically saying, wake up. You aren't what you think you are. You have the Wrong false notion of where you are. And let me tell you where you are. That lukewarm water that comes in your city that you can't stand, that's how you are. And to be honest, I can't stand you either. Not a great place to be in with with God. Okay? Just not where, where it is. But let me explain something about our life. Is that there are reasons we are where we are. There are reasons we are where we are. There were reasons the Laodicean church was where they were. They said, I'm rich, I've prospered, and I need nothing. And how many of us day in and day out think about and profess with our mouths that we have a relationship with God, but we live as if we need nothing from God? And I think that's where we find ourselves a lot of times. God, I got this under control, and I'll call you when I need you. And when tragedy and difficulty strike and and, and trials and tribulation and struggle come, we're like, God, I need you to come over here. I need you to help me out right here. If you can get this, I've got this over here. And when you fix this, I'm back to, I'm rich, I prospered, and I need nothing. There are reasons we are where we are today. There were reasons that the Laodicean church was where they were. And the fact of the matter is this. We are comfortable with things as they are. You are right now. You're very comfortable with things as they are. Now, if I were to come in here, turn off the heat, and remove all the chairs, there's going to be some questions. Why is it cold, and where's my seat? We can do things to kind of make it a little bit more uncomfortable. But the fact of the matter is, is we get comfortable with things where they are. Here's how I know. All I have to do is just assess the last year. All I'm going to do is just assess from a year ago. A year ago at this time, we were starting to hear of COVID-19 or what we know as the coronavirus. Some people thought it's never going to make it to America. It will just stay away from here. Others thought, this is the real deal. This could not be good. This could turn out really, really bad for the world. It wasn't too long from this point, okay, right now, that within a month and a week's time, schools would be shut down, employers would be shutting down businesses, and people would have to be working from home. And fear started to set inside the people in America and the people in the world. And it could be rightfully so. We just didn't know a whole lot about what was going on. We couldn't quite figure it out. It wouldn't take too long into that that people started going, man, I never realized how busy I was. I never realized what I gave my time to. I didn't realize how much I watched sports. I didn't realize that, that I would find myself going ho-hum and numb through life and just in this routine. And, and you started to reflect and you look back and go, man, I've missed so much. And people started going, you know what I'm loving? I'm loving this family time. Oh my God, this is, oh, I've missed this. How in the world could I let myself get so blinded by life that I've missed what was right in front of me. And what COVID-19 did is take something that was comfortable, make it uncomfortable so that we would see what we couldn't see without that. 
but it wouldn't be too long. Because you know what happens a lot of times? When a high place is removed, okay, whatever that be, school was gone, uh, sports were gone, jobs maybe still be gone, I don't know, but all these things started to be eliminated and high places started to be ripped down. And we were left with a choice right there, standing on the high place. And for many people, all they did was see a high place removed from them that they didn't choose to remove and immediately put another high place right back up. You know what the new high place was called? New normal. I'm going to make my life comfortable with what's going on and I'm going to be satisfied with where things are. Just, this is, just is what it is. And we started to create a new normal. We started to get comfortable. And people started to make decisions and look at things differently and go after other things. And then all of a sudden, you know what happened? I'm not saying COVID-19 is not real, but COVID-19 has become the high place. It's the excuse now. I can't do that because of COVID-19. Oh, but you can do this over here. But I can't do that. Oh, but you can go here. Oh, I see. All we did was realign our lives with a new excuse. And I'm not saying that it's not real. It is real. But what I'm telling you is, is we're no different than the church at Laodicea. Because what they did is, even after the earthquake that shook up everything that went there, guess what they did? They piggybacked off the richness of the land and the richness of the city. And all they did was rebuild right back to where they were. Nothing really changed. And we have to ask ourselves, as we reflect back over a whole year and say, is anything any different now than it was one year? ago or are we still just comfortable with things the way they are lukewarm not hot not cold just meh right in the middle and here's what I would tell you this morning because we've looked at this I just rephrased it a little bit if we find ourselves lukewarm it's because we are clinging to our own version of more rather than surrendering to God's own version of more God has a version of more. It's abundant life and life in abundance. We have a version of more, and we often choose that and cling to that over God's version of more. And God's version of more is laid out all throughout Scripture. And God is going to call the church of Laodicea to more. And I think when he starts calling the church of Laodicea to more, and we can go back through Revelation and we can look at the church at Ephesus, uh, Thyatira, Philadelphia, Sardis, like all of these churches. We can look back and learn a lot of things about our own spiritual health and our own spiritual life and our own church to say, is God calling us to his version of more instead of settling for what we think is more? And so here's how he calls the church back at Laodicea to more. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Two key words. Zealous and repent. We're going to get to zealous in a minute, but let me just explain really quick what repent means. Repent means you're going in one direction, you turn around and go the complete opposite direction. I was going toward my own version of more, I've turned completely around and started going to God's version of more. I'm repenting from my way of life and the things that I've done and my sin and my wrongdoing and my rebellion against God, and I'm turning and I'm going toward God and running to Him. And God initiated the ability to have repentance by sending his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And there's some here this morning, and there's some watching online, and I tell you this, there's plenty out in the world who have never experienced repentance in Jesus Christ. He, they've never turned from who they are and tur turned toward who he is and let him give you a new life. You, he takes off the old, he puts on the new. And in order to do that, we have to repent. 
And that's what he's saying. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, I just want to go back to the church at Ephesus real quick. Because this is a stern challenge for us this morning. It's been a stern challenge for me this week. Reflection is a big thing. And a lot of times we don't take time to just really reflect and take ourselves back to places. I had the ability to do that this morning. I'm sitting here early in the morning. It's quiet. I'm by myself. I open my phone and it gives me like a, a memory on my pictures. And it's Titus. Not Titus now, Titus then. Because it was 10 years ago today that Brittany and I walked out of the orphanage with Titus. And I had the moment to go back there and I closed my eyes and I just reflected the joy and the happiness and everything that was surrounded in that moment, seeing the other families take their kids out of the orphanage, watching us walk out of the orphanage, just celebrating this moment that this process is finally over. And I can't believe it's come full circle. And I'm just thinking, and this joy is welling up inside of me. And this, this moment, I'm just like having a moment in my office. And I take a picture of it, and I send it to my family. And I say, can you all believe, 10 years ago today, we walked, this happened. We walked out of the orphanage. Like, this is, this is it. And they got to celebrate in that reflection and in that moment and in that time. Because going back often brings us joy in the present and that's the challenge of the church at Ephesus and I think that this is where a lot of people professing Christianity maybe are and it says this I have this against you talking to the church at Ephesus that you have abandoned the love that you had at first you've abandoned it That passion that you had when you gave your life to Jesus Christ and you experienced salvation in Him, the joy that was overflowing in you at that time, you've turned from it. That's what he's telling the church at Ephesus. That time that Paul came and, and, and these people with Paul were planting the church there and people, genuine excitement was bubbling up and overflowing. And now we fast forward several years and you've abandoned that. You've lost it. There are times where I feel myself sinking into this idea of maybe lukewarmness or I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself kind of down in a rut. And what I do is I go back to 1998 at, Mobile, at the University of Mobile, Alabama. There in the auditorium, I picture myself right there because that's the night I gave my life to Christ. And I remember what that was like. I remember the joy I had, how excited I was. And I I was just like confused. I didn't know a whole lot that was going on. But I knew and had clear direction from that moment forward what my life was going to be like. And when I feel like things are just going on a downward slide and the world's not going the way I think it ought to go or I find myself chasing my version of more instead of God's, I take myself back to 1998 and I let that relive and replay in my mind over and over and over again because he says, remember therefore from where you have fallen. I remember who I was before Christ and who Christ has made me at that moment and then now who I am in Christ. And I let that soak up in my life. And he tells them, repent and do the works you did at first. He says, repent. The same word he told Laodicea, he says, you need to repent. You need to confess your sins. That's what God's Word tells us. If you confess your sins, He will be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And for some of you in here, you need to do that. You need to repent and you need to humble yourself before God and give yourself over to God and say, you know what, God, I have. I've never made you Lord of my life. I've never given my life to you. I've never trusted you. I've never placed my faith in you. And you need to do that because what he did is already done for us. And he took our penalty for the sin that we're supposed to bear. 
And he said, I'll bear it for you. And I will give you the opportunity for new life. But if you're sitting in here this morning and you're saying, you know what? I have made a profession, but you're right. I'm in a rut. I'm stuck. And to be honest with you, I'd be considered lukewarm. I'm not real happy with where I am. I'm really a mad Christian. I'm like just apathetic. I'm cold. I'm indifferent. Then here's what you need to do because it says, remember from where you have fallen. You need to go back to the original flame of your soul. And you need to go back to your first love. Go back. You need to return. Because that's what he was challenging the church at Ephesus. You need to go back to your first love. You need to remember that time. When Paul was preaching. Or Apollos or Timothy or Titus. Or Priscilla and Aquila or whoever else was there. You need to go back to that time when you were overjoyed and overflowing with excitement and you were just bubbling over and you couldn't wait to tell people about Jesus. You need to go back to that. You need to return and go back. I think today in the church, we've just lost passion. We've just lost a zeal. We've lost what it means just to give God everything we are. And we've stopped pursuing Christ because we're satisfied with salvation. And it's like, I'm going to heaven. I'm good to go. Just whatever with the rest of the stuff. And that's not life in abundance. That's not what God called us to do. And there are things that we can do in our life and that we must do in order to continue to fan the flame and to let that just happen in our lives. A lot of the times we're caught sitting and we're caught with our back turned and we're not ready and we're not prepared to move forward because we're not fanning the flame in our life. And the question then is, it's okay, I return to my first love. How do I continue to have this passion and zeal? How do I continue just to, to, to keep going and, to, and to, to be on fire? And listen, there are going to be days where you're just not on fire. Okay, there are days I'm just not on fire. All right, I just, I just struggle through that day. I just, I, I just press myself into who he is, and I keep going. And if he gives me another day, we just keep grinding forward. But a lot of times we just stop, and we're like, you know what? I'm going to heaven. Forget the rest of the stuff. I don't need it. And yet we do, because God calls us to love God and love people. And the mission of Encounter is to love God, love people, and lead them to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And because being a fully devoted follower of Jesus is where we find that abundant life. We're finding our satisfaction in who He is and what He's doing and how He's transforming us. And let me tell you something. The people in the world need to see Christians on fire. They need to see followers of Jesus with a passion and a zeal and an urgency and a desire to want to, to tell people about Jesus. They want to look at your life and they want to say, you know what? I want what they have. I don't know what it is about them. But their life seems to just be a complete train wreck and yet they are bubbling with joy and they can always muster a smile and everything seems to be just going great with them. I don't know how they can do what they're doing and still have that type of joy. But whatever it is, that's what I want. The question is, is are they even seeing that in us? I think Paul tells us in Romans 12 a lot of things about this. If you were to look at the heading of Romans 12, my particular Bible says marks of a Christian. That could be evidences that you are a follower of Jesus. And are these evident in your life? Basically this, do I love God above all else? That's the first one. Then the next one to back that up is does my life reflect that I love God above all else? Because that, that, that's a game changer. Okay? When I was coaching at Apollo, you knew I coached at Apollo. You know why? I was at practice. I was on the field. Sometimes yelled at the refs. And you know what else? I wore the gear. I was a coach. 
The question is, is when we go out in this world, do people see that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? That you have passion and zeal. That I don't have to wear certain things. And they just know something's different about me. They want to be there. They want to discover and they want to talk about it. And they want to, like, what is going on with you? Like, what's happening? I don't get this whole thing. Well, let me just tell you. And this is where Romans 12 plays a huge role. Look at Romans 12, 9 through 10. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this. But look what it says. Let love be genuine. Is your love for others genuine? Are you loving others so that you can get something from them and then love them and leave them? Let your love be genuine. Where does genuine love start? It's not that we loved him. It's that he first loved us. And when he loves us and then we abide in him and love him back, our love becomes genuine. Then it tells us this, abhor what is evil. A better word in that is just hate what is evil. How about this? Hold fast to what is good. Are you hating what is evil and are you clinging to what is good? Well, guess what Jesus said? No one is good but God alone. What do we need to cling to? Hold fast or hate what is evil? Cling to God. He's the one that's good and makes us good. Then it says this. You know how the whole love God and then you have the love people. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know what was not in this passage? Chase your version of more. Get more for yourself. Do what you want to do with your time. Make sure that you take care of you first and then worry about everybody else. That's not in here. He's saying love one another. Outdo one another. And as we do those things, that is fanning the flame in our lives to want to grow and to just desire to tell people about Jesus and to go and to serve and to help one another and to grow together with one another. But then he says this right here, and this all plays together. He says, do not be slothful in zeal. Another translation says, not lagging in diligence. That word zeal is enthusiasm and effort. That's what that, that, that term tells us. It says, don't be lazy, give effort. Don't be lazy, be enthusiastic. And you're going to say, listen, that's not my personality. Well, I'm nothing like you. You just seem to like muster this up and it's like it just comes out. Listen. This isn't a personality contest, and it's not about blaming my lack of passion or my passion on my personality. It's the more we're in Christ, the more he wants to do and grow through us, and the more he starts transforming us and doing other things. And it's like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing him at work over here and over here and over here. I've got this like kingdom focus. I've never seen these things in my life. And, and what I'm doing is, is I'm putting effort into growing in the relationship that I have in Jesus Christ. But a lot of the times, we don't even put the effort in. Give me what I need on Sunday for the rest of the week, and I'll come back and get some more next Sunday. And you can't do that. You can't live off what was given to you today, because what God is giving you today, listen, church, it's for today. It's not for tomorrow. He's going to give you something else tomorrow. It could play and roll with what is going on today, but he's going to give you something else for tomorrow because tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. You may not have enough grace in your life right now for what's coming tomorrow. You may not sense that in your life. And that's what he's saying. Don't be lazy in enthusiasm and zeal. Be ready to speak. Be ready to share. Be ready to show. Then he says, be fervent in spirit. That word fervent means boiling. Boiling. Instantly hot. As in, you're ready, you're boiling, you've studied the word, you've prayed, you've focused your efforts and energy to, to abiding in Jesus Christ, as John 15 tells us, and all of a sudden you're starting to feel this flame inside like Jeremiah. It's a flame in my bones, I can't shut it in, I have to let it out. 
and that I'm fervent in spirit. I'm, I'm like ready to go. I'm hot. I'm on fire. And I'm ready to share Jesus with people. And I'm ready to show this world my passion and enthusiasm for what is most important in my life. And he says, serve the Lord. How do we be, not be slothful in zeal? And how do we be boiling over to the point? Well, we serve the Lord. How do we serve the Lord? We love God and we love people. We serve God and we serve others. That's what it comes down to. This, this life that he's given us is not made for us to sit back in a recliner and wait for the day of triumph or until the day he calls us home to death. That's not what we're made for. Then he says this, rejoice in hope. What hope? Hope in eternity. Hope in eternal life in his presence with him. To be forever with him as we were designed to be from the very beginning. I'm going to rejoice in the hope no matter what's coming at me right now. That's why James says, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you endure trials of many kinds. You can rejoice in the hope that God is doing something in you now, but there is a hope for the future. And then he says, oh, be patient in tribulation. Sometimes, a lot of times, we find ourselves lukewarm is because we don't like this. I don't like suffering. I don't like disappointment. I don't like struggling. And I don't like difficulty. So forget it. I don't want it. I'm not going to be patient. If I can fix it, I'm going to fix it. And then a lot of times, you know what God does? He pulls us right back on over and puts us right in front of the same tribulation. And you're going to stare it in the face. And he says, be patient. I'm going to do something in you, through you, around you, all over you, and in front of you. I need you to walk through this. Oh, God, I don't like this. No, right here. I need you to be patient in tribulation. We are not patient through the idea of suffering. It's hard. It, it, it beats us down a lot of times. We begin to fear. We begin to live in defeat. And we're just kind of struggling through this. And it's like, no, I'm doing something in you. I need you to be patient in this. And then overall, I need you to be constant in prayer. Okay, these are all things that we're supposed to be doing. Not waiting on him just to do in us. Not sitting back in the recliner going, okay. God, you just, you tell me when it's time to move. I'll be here. You know where I am. All right. And years pass and nothing's happening. But he's telling us, don't be lazy. Don't be boiling in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Here's the best thing that I could come up with this on this concept that God just kind of just put it in my, my heart on this is this right here. Become not okay with okay. I'm not okay with just okay. I just, I'm just not okay with it. I'm not going to settle for just okay. And I'm going to be not okay with it because Jesus said life in abundance. And where is life in abundance found? But in him. So I want to pursue him. I want to keep going after him. I want to dig into him. I want to know him because it is in him that that abundance comes. And you know what? I don't want to be just okay. I don't want to just be. I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be ap apathetic. I don't want to be indifferent. I don't want to be cold or bored, lifeless or spiritless. I don't want this. And here's what Francis Chan said in regards to this right here. He says, following Christ is not something that can be done half-heartedly or on the side. It's not a label we can display when it's useful. It must be central to everything we do and are. It's not something that is flippant and just whenever I feel like it, whenever I want to do it. If it aligns with my schedule when I want to fit it in, and as long as nothing else around me is going on, I will have this relationship with Jesus. But that's not what it is. Following Christ is not a half-hearted endeavor. Jesus calls us to be all in because he was all in. We need to be all into Jesus because he was all for us. And it's this passion that we want to well up inside of us, this boiling intensity and this fire. You don't have to go to people and just take the Bible and go slap them over the head with it and say, listen, I'm passionate about Jesus in case you didn't know. You don't have to go to the people on the corner as you're walking in and scream at the people at Rolling Pin who are lined up around the building going, listen, every one of you all getting donuts, you need Jesus. <laughs> it's not what it's
is saying. It's saying that we are so passionate about what God is doing in us, through us, and around us that we want nothing more than to find him in his presence, be there, be present where he is at work so he can work through us, in us, and around us and that we can speak the truth of the gospel to people. Here's what Hegel said about passion. Nothing great in the world has been accomplished without passion. Webster said, fire on the inside affects everything on the outside. Oh, man. I think Paul had a fire on the inside. And what did it affect? Every single place that he showed up. It didn't matter if he was tent making or if he was in a Philippian jail. Or he was in Roman in prison. Or he was on a shipwreck. The fire on the inside affects everything on the outside. Here's what Ward said. Enthusiasm and persistence can make an average person superior. Indifference and lethargy can make a superior person average. Jesus didn't call us to just be eh with our Christianity. He called us to more than that. He didn't call us to lethargy or indifference. He called us to love one another, to outdo one another, to love one another with a brotherly affection, to zeal, and to be boiling and fervent in spirit. Because I believe this, we were made for more than a stagnant, passive, passionless life. We were made for more than me. I don't want my life to just be and I want to pursue God with an intensity, with a fire, with a passion. Because I believe he's given me something I could never get on my own. And here's what Ferdinand Fox said. The most powerful weapon on earth in the human soul is a human soul on fire. The most powerful weapon is a human soul on fire. You want to know what it looks like to be on fire? How about this guy right here as we wrap up this morning? Matthew 16, 44, one of the shortest parables in the Bible. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, and then in joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He found something that nothing in the world could offer. And let me tell you, every person around him knew that he was selling that because he found something that they didn't have either. And he would live a passionate life because he found joy in Christ. And Christ was his everything. And I believe that we are made for more than a meh life, than the rut, than to be stuck. We were made to be hot and boiling and zealous for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, uh, I'm grateful for your word and your challenge and God, how you've worked in my life this week. God, reigniting passion in my heart where areas of my life have not been necessarily maybe as on fire. Just a passion for you and reigniting the importance of having passion and, and going after who you are, God. Because, God, you came to me. And so, God, Lord, I want to abide in you. And I pray right now that that's what we would do as a church. That, God, we would return to our first love, that we would repent. That, God, we would seek you in abundant life and who you are. So, God, here we are at this time of worship. May we give all of us for all of you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. It's, it's a time of worship, but I believe it's also a time of response. I, this altar is open for you. And maybe you settled in life and you just need to come and do business with God right here. 
You just need to be led by the Spirit and let the Spirit guide you to wherever His presence is and to let Him speak to your life. Maybe you need to come up here and just spend time in reflection. Maybe you need to reflect back on your salvation experience and say, you know what? I need to get back to that. I need to get back to that joy and that passion and that love for Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. He's placing it on your heart and you just kind of feel this and he's knocking at the door of your heart. I'll be right over here. No, Mike's over here and Michael and Ken and Michelle are over here. Any of us would be glad to pray with you. The thing is that we just got to move to where God is moving us and to seek his presence there. So like I said, this altar is wide open for you. And Christian's going to lead us in a time of worship, a time for us to cry out to our Savior, to cry out to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. A time to just sit and dwell in who he is and in his presence. So will you stand with us as we sing? I forget who you are and who you have been. A mighty God, perfect and champion and all that I need I will wait for you I will wait for you Holy Spirit come renew all of my strength choose life even in darkness your truth lights a beautiful spark in this heart and soul be still and know that my fear is gone here in your presence a new song 
tell you God's working. Um, he's working on uh, Aaliyah's heart, Aaliyah Phillips, and we're having conversations. Becky's having conversations, and man, she is just seeking God and searching, and God is is definitely in that moment right now, we're going to continue those conversations. So I'm just going to ask you to pray for her and pray for our conversations that we would see God move through that that time. And, and I know God's moving through our church. And, and my prayer for you all, and it has been, and even so this morning, is that, God, you would ignite a fire in our lives, a passion and a, and a heart for people, and that we would see people uh, as God sees them. And so uh, just a couple of things that I just want to make note of. One, E3 this afternoon is live only. 310 to 430. It's live only. No in-person E3. It's just going to be on the Facebook page. So join in on that and, and be a part of that. And then uh, the last one is February 20th. We have Night of Worship right here. Okay, it's time to prepare. And this is a good opportunity to just start preparing your heart for that time where we, we are going to come together and just worship in His presence. And so I love Night of Worship nights. And, and we're going to try to call them nows. So if you see it, just say now. Just know that that's what that is. It's night of worship, and, and we want you to be a part of that. But Encounter, listen, I'm praying for you, and I hope that you're praying for me, and that as we go forward, and we're getting ready to go out to the mission field, out those doors, and as you go out to the mission field, wherever it is that you go next today, live on fire, fervent in spirit, do not lack in zeal. Encounter, have a great week.